Thank you. And before we move to uh, the first question, could I invite the First Minister uh, to make a few remarks following the tragic events in Christchurch in New Zealand? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do want to begin today with heartfelt condolences to the people of New Zealand after last week's appalling terrorist attack in Christchurch. I hope that people in New Zealand can take some comfort from the knowledge that people across the world stand in solidarity with them. Events in New Zealand have been felt deeply here in Scotland as in other countries and perhaps especially in our Muslim community. Last week, Police Scotland arranged reassurance patrols and visits to mosques and to other places of worship. I visited Glasgow Central Mosque on Friday with the Justice Secretary. The Prime Minister of New Zealand has said that nations around the world are now engaged in a global fight against far-right, racist and extremist ideology. Regrettably, she is absolutely right. All of us have a responsibility to engage in that fight. We must tackle hatred and prejudice through the words that we use, the actions that we take and the climate that we create. And I know that all parties in this chamber will play their part in doing that. Presiding officer, in the last week, uh, we have also seen an attack in Utrecht and the stabbing of a teenager in Surrey. And our condolences are with all of those affected uh, by those incidents as well. Uh, let us today express sympathy and solidarity with the victims of racist and extremist violence in Christchurch and around the world. And above all, let us make clear our determination that the proponents of hate will be defeated by the values of kindness, compassion and love. Thank you. We turn now to our questions. The first question from Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I associate all of us in the Scottish Conservatives with the remarks the First Minister has just made and offer support for any measures required to reassure those who are attending mosques in Scotland? Uh, many of Scots will have friends and family who live or visit regularly to New Zealand who will have been deeply affected. However, for many in Scotland's Muslim community, events on the other side of the world must never have felt closer to home. As we embrace them with our good wishes and condolences, we must, as the First Minister said, work together to think afresh what must be done by us all to counter this defining 21st century scourge. Presiding Officer, over the last 10 years, the SNP has launched two major drug strategies. And during those 10 years, drug deaths have tragically now doubled. We are now on course to have the largest number of deaths per head than anywhere else in Europe. Does the First Minister believe the strategies have been a success or a failure? First Minister. These are challenging issues and I readily concede that the government, this government, any government, has to remain open to fresh thinking and new ideas. Uh, on the issue of drugs death, uh, the, the situation is, is not uh, one that any of us would consider to be uh, acceptable. But as I think I said in the chamber last week, uh, many uh, of uh, the people who uh, have died uh, have lived with alcohol and drug use for a long time. They become more vulnerable as they grow older as a result of their complex health and social needs. Uh, what is more encouraging, although I, I'm not overstating this point, is that the last report showed fewer deaths in the under 25 population. And recent reports also highlight following heroin use, particularly again, in the under 25s. Uh, work is underway, as I'm sure Jackson Carlow is aware, in both Dundee and Glasgow to consider what more can be done to tackle drug deaths. Uh, and of course, uh, that work will be of relevance across Scotland. And we want to see the outcomes of this work uh, before considering uh, what further action we should be taking. Jackson Carlow. Well, I thank the First Minister for that. We, we all want to help sort this crisis, but the first step is surely to admit that the current policy isn't working as it should. Uh, regrettably, it has been a failure, and, and here's an example of that. We know rehabilitation services in prisons can be vital to turning around people's lives. Yet, as my colleague Adam Tompkins has discovered in recent days, in one of our biggest prisons, Barlini, a successful voluntarily funded recovery project, a cafe where people can go and get their lives back on track, is now facing closure. Now, how can it be right that we are prioritising spending millions of the pounds we do spend on methadone programmes and successful projects like this are otherwise put at risk. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, can I say to uh, Jackson Carlow and indeed to Adam Tompkins, the Justice Secretary has uh, received a letter on this issue and uh, that will be responded to in due course. I think it's important to 
advise the Chamber that the Scottish Government has not previously funded recovery cafes, uh, but we do provide funding for what is called the Scottish Recovery Consortium. Uh, and of course, the Scottish Prison Service adopts a therapeutic approach in dealing with the issues of addiction and provides support for those with addiction problems in their care. And the new alcohol and drug strategy highlights the importance of recovery communities and the need for them to be at the very heart of any proposals. They also help to reduce stigma because they provide a, a visible face of recovery as well as insights into addiction and harm. So through our sustained funding of the Scottish Recovery Consortium, we will continue to do what we can to support the growth of recovery communities across the country. And of course, we'll give consideration to the points that have been made in Adam Tompkins' letter. Jackson Carla. Yes, in this mix of approaches, my question was not intended as a criticism, but just a few miles from Parliament is Castle Craig Hospital near West Linton. A drug rehabilitation centre with capacity for residential drug rehab patients visited recently by our health spokesman Miles Briggs. Now they told him that Castle Craig is not receiving NHS referrals and is now mostly being kept going by patients who are being referred from the Netherlands for treatment. Now isn't the First Minister like me concerned that Dutch patients are getting better access to this Scottish rehabilitation project here in Scotland than Scots locally in need of the same support and treatment? First Minister. Firstly, I am very happy to look into uh, that specific example. We want uh, people to have access to rehabilitation services and a broad range of rehabilitation services. We are providing, uh, as the Scottish Government, £70 million in this financial year to help reduce uh, the harms caused by alcohol uh, and drugs. Uh, and that includes uh, an additional £20 million for uh, drug and alcohol services, which uh, are allocated to support new approaches so that we are responding in a much more joined up and person centred uh, way. Uh, and that kind of investment is important. It's also important, and again, I'm not trying to make a party political point here about a very serious issue. It is important that we are prepared to take forward innovative and evidence-based new approaches, even if at first they can seem to be very challenging, particularly for public opinion. And you know, that is why we supported the principles behind Glasgow's uh, proposals for a medically supervised safer drug consumption facility and heroin assisted treatment uh, in the city. And I think it's important that we work uh, with health and social care partnerships on new approaches, as well as making sure that we are investing in rehabilitation. And I hope that is something uh, that the Conservatives will think about giving us support on because, of course, we do need to persuade the UK government to do what is required. Jackson Carla. Yes, I do respect the First Minister's approach on that. It is something we have looked at. It's unfortunately that one policy, one where we do fundamentally disagree. I mean, we do think the policy should be to get people clean of drugs, not to provide opportunities where they can take them. But Scottish Conservatives have set out a clear plan to help, to help tackle Scotland's growing drug crisis. Getting first-time offenders into treatment directing more money into rehabilitation programmes run by third sector bodies, and at the same time reviewing, at least reviewing, the failed methadone programme. Presiding officer, we're actually not, let's admit it, overrun at the moment in politics by issues around which we can form any kind of consensus. But on this one vital issue, would the First Minister commit today to working across this chamber, because we will, to improve the drug strategy for the next 10 years, so that we do cut drug deaths, we do cut drug addiction, and we come down hard on those peddling misery across our communities. First Minister. Well, can I reiterate uh, my willingness to work across the chamber? I've said, I think, in uh, response, uh, a couple of my responses today that I will consider the points that Jackson Carlow had raised, uh, and I give that assurance again. I would ask for that in return, though. Yeah. And I, I am slightly concerned at the almost knee-jerk way that Jackson Carlow ruled out the fresh thinking around safer drug consumption facilities. If we are genuinely to try to find a consensus, we have to be open to new thinking. And sometimes that will be very tough and very, very challenging. So I would appeal to Jackson Carlow perhaps to reconsider his opposition to that, just as he is asking me to be open-minded to any proposals that he makes. Uh, we will continue to make sure that we have the right strategies in place to deal with what I think we all accept is a challenging and complex issue. And that involves taking a very hard line against those who supply <coughs> drugs. And we saw figures earlier this week about police seizures uh, of drugs. It definitely involves support, particularly rehabilitation support for those uh, who are addicted 
to drugs. Uh, and thirdly, it does involve being open to new ideas and new thinking. And I think if we can all uh, agree broadly around that, uh, then perhaps we can build a consensus that allows us in Scotland to tackle uh, what we all agree is unacceptable. Uh, and we want to see a, a considerably uh, improved situation around. So I hope that we have Jackson Carlow and the Conservative support on that. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Um, uh, can I add the deep felt condolences of the Scottish Labour Party to the family and friends of all those who lost their lives in the terror attack in Christchurch last Friday uh, and to offer our, practical, our support for practical action uh, to defeat racism and hatred wherever it occurs. Uh, to ask the First Minister why there is a staffing crisis in the NHS. First Minister. Uh, there is not uh, a staffing crisis in the National Health Service. There are record numbers of people uh, working in the National Health Service. In fact, I uh, can tell Richard Leonard that staffing levels in NHS Scotland are now at uh, a record high and are up by over uh, 13,600 uh, since 2006, uh, just before this government uh, took office. Numbers of consultants are up by 51%, uh, qualified nurses and midwives up by 8%. Uh, there is higher NHS staffing per head in Scotland than there is in NHS uh, England. Our NHS staff, of course, work under considerable pressure and we're grateful to them for the job that we do, they do. But we will continue to invest in our NHS to ensure record numbers of staff so that they can continue to deliver uh, the excellent uh, services that they do. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, this week, this Parliament's Health and Sport Committee, um, following the tragic events at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, began its inquiry into infection control standards. And new figures released to Scottish Labour this week reveal that the number of domestic staff, that is cleaners, employed at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital is falling. In March 2018, 464 cleaners were employed at the hospital. But according to latest figures, that number has dropped to 440. First Minister, why at the very point when it is facing a rise in infection outbreaks, is Scotland's biggest hospital employing fewer people on the front line whose job it is to keep that hospital clean and safe? First Minister. I'm sure Richard Leonard uh, will have heard uh, the Health Secretary already address this issue uh, publicly. This is an issue that has been raised uh, with the Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, Health Board. It is absolutely imperative that all health boards in all hospitals ensure uh, appropriate numbers of domestic and cleaning staff. Of course, it, it is for health boards to consider the configuration of staffing as uh, Richard Leonard uh, will know and those of us who represent Glasgow constituencies know particularly well there has been uh, a significant change in the configuration of Glasgow hospitals over the last uh, number of years and the overall staffing uh, numbers uh, will undoubtedly reflect that. The last point I would make uh, is, is this. We will continue to raise uh, issues uh, directly with health boards to make sure that they are addressed where that is necessary. But notwithstanding the very serious incidents that we've seen at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, and we've discussed them on many occasions in this chamber before, and I welcome uh, the Health Committee's inquiry into these issues. Uh, overall, in Scottish hospitals, infection rates uh, are down considerably. I, I think I heard... Uh, a you can see Jackie Bailey um, in the chamber just now when her and I used to regularly have exchanges about the levels of C. diff in our hospitals after the tragic incident at the Vale of Leven. Uh, C. diff, MRSA, infections generally are down in some cases by more than 80%. Uh, so let's tackle issues where they arise. Richard Leonard is, is right to raise these issues. Uh, but let's not lose sight of the good work that has been done in our NHS to reduce infection and to put a real focus on patient safety. Richard Leonard. Well, Presiding Officer, I should also make it clear that this is not unique to one hospital. It is replicated right across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. There are fewer domestics, fewer porters, fewer laundry and linen staff compared to last year. First Minister, it's clear that we have a staffing crisis in our health service and it's not confined to consultants, nurses and midwives. It's facilities staff, it's domestics, it's catering workers, it's porters. And it's laundry staff too. All workers without whom no hospital can operate. So, 
We know there is a parliamentary inquiry and reviews are being carried out by the Health Board and by the Government. But this is serious and it's urgent and the public and those under pressure staff need a commitment today that this reduction in these vital frontline jobs is reversed as soon as possible. Is the First Minister prepared today to give them that commitment? First Minister. Uh, we will continue, as I said earlier on, to work with health boards, including Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to make sure that they have uh, appropriate staffing levels across all specialties within the NHS, and that is important. I would repeat what I've already said. There are record numbers of staff working in our National Health Service. Richard Leonard says these issues are urgent, and I couldn't agree more. I, I know how devastating infection outbreaks uh, are in hospitals, uh, principally for patients, their families, but also for the staff who work uh, in our hospitals. That's why the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate report that was commissioned uh, and instructed by the Health Secretary into the Queen Elizabeth has already reported, um, and the recommendations that have been made have already been accepted by the Health Board uh, and are being implemented. So, uh, whatever disagreements we have uh, and uh, whatever uh, legitimate points, and they are legitimate points that Richard Leonard raises, I, I don't think anybody could doubt the seriousness of this government and indeed the seriousness of the health service when it comes to tackling infections in our hospitals. And overall, uh, the figures uh, say that things are going in the right direction, but that does not take away from the need uh, to tackle serious incidents when they arise, and we will continue to do exactly that. Thank you. We turn to some constituency supplementaries. Uh, Liam Kerr to be followed by Alistair Allen. Very mm. grateful, President Officer. Cove Harbour fishing community is suffering. First, their landing was bought and closed by a private landlord. They went to court and won the public rights of access but faced significant legal costs. Several boats were then destroyed in a fire and now the landlord has closed access to the beach. They've written several times to the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, requesting a meeting uh, even if it's in Holyrood, to discuss their rights and their future, but to no avail. So would the First Minister ask the Cabinet Secretary to meet them and not risk ignoring a community facing the loss of their livelihoods? First Minister. Well, of course, we want to do everything we possibly can to help any community experiencing difficulties. I'm uh, not aware beyond what the member has just said of the content of the correspondence to Fergus Ewing, but I'm happy to give an undertaking to look into that. Uh, and if Fergus Ewing uh, thinks there is help the Scottish Government can offer, certainly to meet uh, with those affected. Alistair Allen to be followed by Jackie Bailey. President Officer, earlier this week, Ofgem announced that it was minded to reject proposals for a 600 megawatt transmission link to the Western Isles, instead saying that it would support a much reduced 450 megawatt link. This has been met with extreme disappointment in my constituency as it will severely constrain capacity for future community projects and place projects from the Western Isles potentially at a disadvantage. What pressure can the Scottish Government bring on Ofgem and indeed the UK Government to reconsider this short-sighted decision? First Minister. Well, we are absolutely committed to unlocking the vast renewables potential of our islands and the associated economic benefits for our island communities. Uh, we are very concerned at the uncertainty over the proposed connection from the Western Isles. Uh, the Scottish Government believes that for the full renewables potential of the Western Isles to be realised, a larger link is required. So I very much agree uh, with the sentiments of Alistair Allen's question. We have made arguments to support this point directly to Ofgem, and we will continue to do so as we engage further with Ofgem with island stakeholders and with developers during the ongoing consultation process. And I can assure Alistair Allen and the Chamber that we will make absolutely every effort to secure the right outcome for the Western Isles. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Miles Briggs. The First Minister will be aware that my constituent Jagtar Singh Johal has spent more than 500 days detained in prison in the Punjab. There have been accusations of torture, and he has now faced his 77th pre-trial preliminary hearing. His MP, Martin Doherty Hughes, is to be commended for pursuing the matter vigorously. But will the First Minister use her influence and speak to the Foreign Secretary and UK Government to urge them to provide support and assistance to Mr Johal and his family? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Jackie Bailey for raising this issue? Uh, I know she has raised it previously, and as uh, she's right to say, uh, the MP Martin Doherty Hughes uh, 
uh, has been assiduous in raising uh, the rights and situation of his constituent. Uh, we have raised this issue and will continue to do so. The Deputy First Minister has raised it directly with Indian uh, ministers on uh, recent visits to India. Uh, he has raised it with the British High Commission and uh, I believe, uh, although I will double check this, we have uh, raised this directly with the Foreign Office and I am happy to undertake that we will do so again uh, and thank Jackie Bailey for raising the issue. Miles, please. First Minister, in recent weeks I've received um, contact from families across Scotland who are facing unacceptable waits for cleft surgery. Two years ago, we warned SNP ministers about the impact of the closure of the Edinburgh unit and centralisation of cleft services. This parliament voted against the centralisation, but ministers pressed on against the will of this parliament. One case highlighted me, to me just this week is a young man who's been waiting now two years for promised final surgery and is no way for the, further forward in when he will receive this. Families are also telling me now they're looking to NHS England to receive this surgery. Can the First Minister apologise to families for these waits and what will she do to correct a mistake this government made? First Minister. Well, I, as I've said many times before in the Chamber, I regret where any patient uh, has to wait longer for treatment than we would uh, want uh, to be the case. On the issue of cleft surgery, the redesign of that service, uh, as I recall, was on clinical grounds to make sure a quality and safe service. If Miles Briggs would like to uh, give further details of the constituents who are raising uh, issues with him, uh, the Health Secretary will look into those uh, and correspond further uh, with him when she's had the, the opportunity to do so. Turn to question three, Patrick Harvey. On behalf of the Scottish Greens, can I join with others in expressing our shared concern for the bereaved and the injured following the far-right terrorist attack in New Zealand but also our respect for the response that country is showing, recommitting to the values of their inclusive society and refusing to placate the far right as far too many politicians around the world have done. Presiding officer, last night in the midst of a crisis of our own making, the Prime Minister again refused to listen to reason and instead effectively told the public that Parliament is their enemy. Scotland needs the freedom to take a different direction, leave behind this chaos and find our own way out of the crisis. It's why we need our independence. The First Minister told us that she would say something about her preferred timing within weeks. That was two months ago. So can I ask again, when? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I agree with Patrick Harvey that the Prime Minister's comments last night were deeply irresponsible, yeah. and I hope that in time she will reflect on that. Uh, but her comments also failed uh, to accept any of the responsibility she bears for the mess that uh, the UK is in right now. Uh, she wanted to blame everybody except herself, and yet I think most people know that it was the Prime Minister who triggered Article 50 without a plan, it was the Prime Minister who drew self-defeating, contradictory lead lines that boxed it in from the start. It was the Prime Minister who called an unnecessary general election, uh, who delayed the first vote on her deal in an attempt to run down the clock. It was the Prime Minister who failed to listen and change course after the first defeat of her deal and then again after the second. Uh, she must change course now before it is too late and she must bear responsibility for the mess this country is in. Um, on the issue of independence, the frustration people feel right now at our country, Scotland's future, uh, being determined uh, by the DUP and a cabal of right-wing Tories is understandable, yes. yeah. and I absolutely share it. Um, I said I'd wait until the end of this phase of the Brexit negotiations before setting out my views on the way forward for Scotland. Having uh, done so this long, I think it is reasonable to wait to see uh, what clarity emerges in the next few days, even if I suspect that will just be clarity, that there will be no uh, clarity. Uh, and then I will set out my views on the path forward. Uh, but there is no doubt, nobody can be in any doubt that change is needed. The last three years have shown that the status quo is broken. It cannot protect Scotland from the folly of Brexit and all that flows from that. Even the most ardent unionist must see that the way we are governed uh, now by Westminster is broken. The question is, how do we fix that for the future? And there's no doubt in my mind that letting people in Scotland choose an independent future is the best way to do that. Patrick Harvey. At 
every stage of this nightmare, this Parliament has tried to persuade the Prime Minister to change course. We've called for the, the narrow 2016 result and Scotland's Remain vote to be respected. We've called for our place in the single market to be protected. We've called for the public to have the right of a final say and the chance to cancel this crisis. If the Prime Minister succeeds in closing off all of these positive choices and the country finds itself being driven to the edge of the cliff next week, this time next week, if that happens, does the First Minister agree that MPs must be prepared finally to put the public interest first and be willing, if all else fails, to do what's necessary and revoke Article 50? Briefer, First Minister. Yes, and indeed uh, the SNP at Westminster and the Greens and the Liberal Democrats and Plaid Cymru issued a joint statement last night to that effect. Uh, SNP MPs will not vote for the Prime Minister's deal because it is a bad deal that will damage Scottish interests and I don't think any Scottish MP uh, should vote for such a deal. But nor will we accept her framing that it is a choice between her deal and no deal. Uh, just because she's not willing to contemplate the alternatives doesn't mean that there aren't any alternatives. One of those alternatives, uh, undoubtedly, is the revocation of Article 50. Uh, and if all else fails by this time next week, uh, that is exactly, in my view, what MPs should do. Question for Willie Rennie. Uh, can I associate myself and my party with the remarks of the First Minister about New Zealand? The events in that country were truly sickening. Um, you wouldn't think that we were in the middle of a national crisis if you just listened to the questions from the leaders of the Conservative and Labour parties. But I have to say the last thing this country needs is more division and chaos with independence to compound the division and chaos of Brexit. The first duty of our Prime Minister is Order, to please. keep the country safe. Yet because of the cavalier choices of this Prime Minister, emergency measures under Operation Yellowhammer have been triggered. Medicines, food supply chains, transport, all at risk. Does the First Minister agree with me that no serious Prime Minister should ever threaten such catastrophic consequences, no matter how much she wants her policy to pass? First Minister. Well, before I address that, can I just say to the first part of... Willie Rennie's uh, question there. Uh, the, the inconsistency in Willie Rennie's position is this. He wants people across the UK to have the ability to escape Brexit through a second referendum, and I agree with him on that. Uh, but if that doesn't prove to be possible, he thinks that Scotland should just grin and bear it and yeah. put up with the devastation yeah, yeah, of Brexit instead of Scotland having the choice to escape Brexit and have an independent future. That is a deeply inconsistent uh, position yeah. for him to take, yeah, exactly. and I hope he'll reflect on it. <laughs> on, on the issue of Yellow Hammer, which of course is the emergency planning for uh, a no-deal Brexit, I do think it is beyond comprehension that any Prime Minister could be uh, knowingly allowing the country to be eight days, now round about 200 hours away from that possibility of crashing out of the EU without a deal and requiring that emergency uh, planning work to be done. Uh, I, yesterday, as I have done uh, once a week for several weeks now, chaired a meeting of the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee looking at medicines supplies, food supplies, uh, transport links in the event of a no-deal Brexit. It is outrageous that we are having to expend time energy and resources in doing so. Uh, the Prime Minister really must, before uh, any more time passes and before it is too late, change course, take no deal off the table completely, uh, look at building a broader consensus rather than pandering to the hardliners in our own party and if necessary, dumping Brexit completely. That would be in the best interest of the country. Willie Rennie. But the, the First Minister is wrong. The inconsistency is that to believe that breaking up an economic partnership of 40 years will be chaotic, but breaking up one of 300 years will be a piece of cake. Order, she is the inconsistent one. People Order, are please. scunnered by this agonising Brexit process. Three years on, 200 hours left. Isn't it time 
for a common sense approach. Common sense Order, where we please. have a Prime Minister who takes a no-deal Brexit off the table instead of using it as a threat against her own citizens. Where party leaders, all party leaders, can sit down and talk without the Leader of the Opposition walking out because he doesn't like yeah, Chuka Amuna. Yeah. Where the Prime Minister reaches out to MPs in Parliament rather than insulting them from behind a podium in number 10. Common sense, where we admit that Parliament is incapable of deciding, so we have a public vote to let the people decide. Isn't it time for that common sense approach? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I agree with all of that, uh, I think people across the UK should have the opportunity uh, to vote again, given everything they now know that wasn't known in 2016, which is uh, why I'll be calling for that in London uh, on Saturday, uh, with many others, uh, no doubt uh, hundreds of thousands of others uh, in, in London. Um, and I agree with everything he said about the Prime Minister. I agree with him in his despair about the leader of the Labour Party and his childish Sorry. behaviour last night, when what we need to see is people coming together to find uh, an alternative. Uh, where I disagree with him is in his view that if all of what he has just called for fails, then Scotland should just be powerless yeah. in the face of the disaster uh, of Brexit. I oppose Brexit as he does, but there was nothing inevitable about the chaos yeah, of Brexit. Right. That was down to those who proposed it, having no idea what it looked like in yeah. reality and doing no planning for it. It did not have to be uh, that way. Um, and again, I would say to Willie Rennie, the inconsistency is him standing up here rightly, uh, spelling out the disaster yeah. that Brexit will be, but then saying, if all else fails, Scotland just has to put up with it. Well, I don't yeah. think Scotland has yeah, to put yeah, up with yeah, it, yeah. and I don't think Scotland should have to put up with it. If it comes to it, Scotland choosing independence is a much brighter future yeah, yeah. than remaining part yeah, yeah. of Brexit Britain. Yeah. We have some additional supplementaries. The first from Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Prime Minister last night claimed that the public have had enough. Today, a petition on the UK Parliament website calling for Article 50 to be revoked is already way, uh, well on the way to a million signatures. Support is growing so fast that the website crashed harder than the Prime Minister's credibility. <laughs> Isn't it the case that if the Prime Minister believes that she has the people with her, she should have the courage to put that to the test and call for a people's vote? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. As I said, I thought the Prime Minister's uh, statement last night uh, was deeply regrettable. Um, I think for her to be blaming everybody except uh, herself, beggars belief. Uh, and now is the time, I think, for people across parties to speak out. I mean, I uh, watched last night one of the most powerful contributions that I've ever seen in the House of Commons. Dominic Grieve, yeah. uh, a moderate Tory, I think yeah, everybody yeah. would accept an honourable person, yeah. having the honesty to say that he was ashamed to be uh, in the Conservative Party and the conduct of the Prime Minister made him want to weep. And yet we hear Scottish Conservatives yeah. Yeah. continue to parrot the lines of the Prime Minister. And I often wonder if Jackson Carlaw ever in his quieter moments thinks that it might be better for the country, indeed for his own reputation, for him to actually say what I believe he probably thinks, that this is a mess Carrying on regardless is a profound mistake. The Prime Minister must change course and she must do so now before it's too late. Yeah. Daniel Johnson to be followed by... Thank you very much, Mark presiding Donald. officer. The First Minister will be aware that the British Retail Consortium annual crime survey was published today. It records that 115 shop workers were physically attacked at work every single day across the UK last year. As to estimate that the real problem can be much greater, their estimate is that 34 retail workers are attacked every day in Scotland alone. My bill to protect shop workers is in the final stages of drafting, so can I ask the First Minister what she thinks needs to be done to tackle this growing problem? And will her government work with me to look at what changes in the law may be needed to do so? Because everyone has the right to safety at work, whether they work in an office or on the shop floor. First Minister. Well, can I... Uh 
thank Daniel Johnson for raising this issue and the results of the British Retail Consortium uh, survey. I think it is a very powerful reminder that our shop workers do an essential job, but they do a job that is often dangerous to them, and we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, yes, we will be happy to work with Daniel Johnson and with others to look at what further protections we need to put in place. I note that he says his own bill is in the final stages of drafting. We will look very carefully at that when it uh, is published um, and be happy to consider that and discuss that uh, with him. So, yes, we will be happy to try to build uh, consensus. And Mark Macdonald. On 1st of April, employer contributions to NHS pension schemes will increase from 14.9% to 20.9%. Children's hospices across Scotland have estimated that the increased cost to them will be the equivalent to the salary of nine full-time nurses. The UK Government have stated that charities and hospices are included in the funding provided to NHS England to cover costs of the increase. But Chas say similar commitments have not yet been made to Scottish charities and hospices. Can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will provide funding to help charities and hospice organisations meet this cost increase and ensure they do not have to divert money from the vital support services they provide? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Mark McDonald for raising this issue? He's right to do so. It uh, is a, a concerning uh, issue generally, but in particular for hospices and charities. The Scottish Government has been uh, in discussions with the BMA about how to uh, best disperse additional funding uh, to practices to meet this change, um, and we will continue to do so. And I will specifically ask the Health Secretary to look uh, particularly at the issue of hospices and charities and to come back to Mark McDonald when she's had the opportunity to do so. Question number five, Christine Graham. Uh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the reported travel chaos on the Borders Railway last weekend, as a result of a number of train cancellations, whether the Scottish Government considers that the ScotRail franchise continues to be sustainable. First Minister. Well, I'm disappointed that passengers across a number of routes on the ScotRail network continue to be affected by train cancellations as a consequence of ScotRail's training backlog. Uh, although there is evidence of some improvement in ScotRail's performance at a national level, this will do little to reassure passengers who attempted to travel on the Borders Railway last Sunday and were faced with an unacceptable number of cancellations. Uh, that is why ScotRail's focus must remain on delivering a robust remedial plan which puts passenger interests at the forefront of restoring performance levels. Uh, the remedial plan has been specifically designed to mitigate against train crew and train fleet challenges, and I fully expect ScotRail to ensure that the plan is delivered to reaffirm passenger confidence in the railway. Christine Graham. Uh, thank the First Minister for answer. And there was indeed a service breakdown and uh, meltdown on Sunday in the Borders Railway. Well, it was a breakdown as well. And the cancellations continue. They've continued since that. They've continued today. I heard the Cabinet Secretary talking about the remedial notice and the second one served requires to be, the plan requires to be delivered soon. Well, the plan might be delivered, but that doesn't deliver trains. Tra plans don't drive trains. Isn't it time that the Scottish Government told Scott Rail and Bilo that it's in the last chance saloon? I certainly think so, and so do my constituents. First Minister. Well, I would, I would say to Christine Graham that uh, Scott Rail should uh, treat a remedial plan very much as a last chance saloon. That's the very uh, nature of it. Uh, ScotRail has been left in no doubt that its recent levels of performance, particularly in the borders in Fife, have been completely unacceptable. I've said as much in this chamber. I heard Michael Matheson say so a moment ago as well when uh, members like Annabelle Ewing were raising uh, very legitimate and understandable concerns on behalf of their constituents. We've used contractual mechanisms contained within the franchise agreement to require the remedial plan and ScotRail will publish its performance remedial plan on its website uh, shortly. Uh, the commitments contained in the plan uh, have been contracted as a remedial agreement. Uh, of course, in the event ScotRail does not achieve improved performance or fails to deliver on its contractual commitments, it does, of course, run the risk of the franchise being terminated early. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I recently received a letter from a concerned Borders Railway commuter. He says in his letter, and I quote, it has come to the point where there is genuine surprise that the train is running on time as opposed to it being so frequently cancelled. He goes on to say, the negative effects of this are significant. There is a financial pen penalty imposed by the nursery as a result of collecting my daughter. There is also significant stress and anxiety because of the lateness to my work. Will the First Minister apologise on behalf of her Transport Secretary 
to the hundreds of commuters experiencing transport hell? And will she personally oversee the remedial plan that has been submitted by ScotRail, um, which will be published in the next few days? First Minister. Uh, well, the Transport Secretary will oversee uh, that. Uh, that is uh, part of uh, his responsibilities. And um, obviously, as First Minister, I will retain a very close interest in that as well. Um, I have made very clear, I don't think I could make clearer, that uh, some of the recent uh, performance uh, levels of ScotRail have been completely unacceptable. That is particularly, but not exclusively, the case on the Borders Railway. I could you know, stand here and talk about some of the reasons behind that in terms of train delivery, training requirements, not specifically in relation to the Borders Railway, but in relation, for example, to some... Uh, of the issues we've seen coming in uh, and out of Edinburgh in the last couple of days to network rail failings. But I, I'm not going to do that because it is Scotch Rail's responsibility to make sure that they live up uh, to their uh, performance levels. That's why the remedial plan is so important and why Scotch Rail has to understand how serious uh, the obligation is on them to deliver on the commitments they make in it. And Mark Ruskell. Commuters are suffering poor rail services across Scotland and especially in Fife. Now, last year, the Transport Minister, Mr Yousaf, said in this chamber, and I quote, there will be an upgrade in the rolling stock later in 2018 or early in 2019. Nevertheless, people in Fife should not have to wait for that to get an improvement in their service. So why is it now that Fife commuters are being told it will be the end of 2019 at the very earliest before any improvements come through? Does the First Minister not believe that it's time for her to personally step in and take charge of the ScotRail crisis? First Minister. Well, I made my views clear and I will do so again. Those who uh, are charged with uh, and also uh, remunerated uh, with the responsibility of running our railways are the ones that have to get it right. Um, and they have uh, a responsibility to do so and they have a responsibility to begin delivering the improvements that passengers want to see uh, immediately. And that is what the remedial plan will very much focus on. Of course, there is significant investment in our railways. Uh, there is a renewal of uh, rolling stock. Uh, there's a lot of very positive work that I hope uh, passengers start to get the benefit of uh, very, very soon. But ScotRail must address uh, the reasons, uh, those at least that are within its responsibility behind its dip in performance. And we expect them to do that uh, and to do that very, very quickly. Question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister, in light of the parliamentary reports by both MSPs and MPs, what the Scottish Government's response is to the growing concerns about the effect of social media on the mental health of young people across Scotland. First Minister. Uh, we welcome the report published by the Public Audit Committee last week, which looked at the relationship between social media and mental health. The report made recommendations regarding the need for further research in this area and next month we will publish initial research examining the links between unhealthy social media use and lower mental well-being, uh, particularly in girls and young women. Uh, we're also committed to developing and publishing Scotland's specific advice on how young people can use social media in a healthy way and this will be co-produced by young people uh, for young people and will be informed by the research that we'll publish next month. Liz Smith. Could I thank the First Minister for that helpful answer? Uh, I'm sure that the whole chamber can unite in its deep concern about the shocking statistics which reveal that 60% of 16 to 25 year olds believe that social media places, and I quote, overwhelming pressure on their age group and that mental health referrals have increased by 22% since 2014. Just some of the facts which quite rightly have led MSPs and MPs to state categorically that we all have a duty of care to protect vulnerable users. So as well as the answer that the First Minister has just given me, could I ask her to give us some details about the timescale that she envis envisages for the implementation of the task force delivery plan? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, agree very much uh, with the, the sentiments and the detail of Liz Smith's question. Uh, the internet and social media should be, uh, and in many respects, is a force for good that we should embrace and welcome. But it also does uh, put considerable pressures on young people, and I think particularly on 
young girls. All of us will have uh, young girls, or many of us will have young girls in our family. I've got a niece who's about to enter her teenage years, and it is not difficult to see uh, that pressure uh, that is there. So we must make sure that our young people are equipped to deal with that uh, properly. Um, I've already referred to some of the, the research that we'll publish and some of the work that will flow from that. In terms of the uh, task force, it is taking forward a substantial programme uh, of work, and uh, I'll ask the Mental Health Minister to uh, write to Liz Smith with the precise timescales for the different delivery uh, aspects of that work. But all of this is important work to make sure that we are preventing mental health issues and then providing treatment as quickly as possible where that is required. Uh, and part of prevention is undoubtedly encouraging and supporting a healthy use of social media. And Willie Coffey. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the tragic death of a young 18-year-old girl in Kilmarnock last weekend, followed by the death of another youngster in Ayrshire only hours later. I understand there are no suspicious circumstances involved, but there seem to be a growing number of young people across Ayrshire who are ending their lives <coughs> as a result of suicide. Clearly, this is heartbreaking for the family and friends involved, but would the First Minister be able to offer some hope to youngsters and their families that services are there to help and that if more can be done to help to end these awful tragedies, then it will be done? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I, I want to give that assurance. I, I won't comment on individual cases beyond saying that, of course, my thoughts and condolences are with the families concerned. I know that East Ayrshire Council are already uh, looking at these incidents, uh, I think, with the National Health Service, and they, of course, will want to make sure that they are responding appropriately. Uh, we are absolutely, I think this applies across the Chamber, committed to ensuring uh, that as uh, some of the challenges around mental health uh, change and develop, then our response uh, does so as well. Uh, I said before in the Chamber, uh, the system, as it has developed over many years, uh, sees too many young people refer to specialist services uh, because there are not the services in the community looking both at prevention and early intervention. And much of the investment that we've announced, announced recently, uh, many of uh, the initiatives that we are implementing now tr are trying to redress that balance so that we have a focus on prevention, on early intervention, but also in making sure that the specialist services are there when young people need them. Uh, and I hope and believe this is a programme of work that has widely across the chamber. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Christian Graham on men's sheds. But we're just going to have a short suspension to allow uh, members of ministers and the gallery to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>